Welcome to the Jones Gallery Lecture Series. I'm Sarah Jones. I'm the curator here at Jones Gallery. We're a contemporary art gallery in St. John, New Brunswick, and our core mandate is to present work by contemporary Canadian artists. But art education and art history is also important to us, and we think that the, that the understanding of art history and, and being able to look at historical works of art should be something that's free and understandable and accessible to, to everyone. And that's why we hold public lectures in the gallery and produce videos like the one you're watching today. Uh, we rely on the support of our viewers to keep this series going. So if you've been enjoying our video, or if you enjoyed this one and you would like to contribute, uh, your donation goes directly into supporting all of this, all of this, and, uh, and keeping it going. And we, we really, really appreciate it. And today's video is brought to you by Trudy, Donald, and Marie. Thank you very much for your contribution. If you would like to support our efforts, please donate at jonesgallery.ca slash arthistory. Today, we'll be looking at Edgar Degas' The Absinthe Drinker, completed in 1876. Uh, it shows a solitary figure uh, with, her, with her green glass of, of absinthe. Uh, she cuts quite a lonely figure, and I thought that this was perhaps uh, an apposite painting to discuss given our times of, of solitude during this pandemic. Uh, so first, let me tell you a little bit about Degas and kind of situate him within the, the, the group of the Impressionists. And we do, we do place him within that group. So if you're studying, uh, if you're taking a course on Impressionism, Degas will, will, will be there most likely. Or if you're reading a book on Impressionism, Degas, there'll be a chapter on Degas. He fits rather uneasily into the group, uh, both in terms of himself personally and his biography, but then also his, his artwork. So he, he was kind of in effect part of the French nobility, and uh, so he came from a very wealthy and well-to-do family, and that separated him from, if you watch some of my other videos on, on Monet, Claude Monet, uh, Monet, uh, Renoir, they came from uh, kind of less auspicious Background. So Monet, for instance, his father was a was a shopkeeper. Monet was broke for most of his early career, and uh, and he was always kind of borrowing from his friends. And his friends were complaining about these, you know, these impecunious artists like like Monet and Renoir, kind of always uh, always kind of clinging to to their more wealthy wealthy members of the group. Not so with with Degas. He was independently wealthy. Uh, he had a very prestigious art education at kind of prestigious art institutes and art academies in Paris. Uh, he studied in, in Florence and Rome, so he went to Italy to study the old masters. He had a, uh, an interest in, in, in line and draftsmanship and careful preparation of multiple drawings and then preparation of the final piece. And that is in contrast to, if you know anything about, say, Monet and Renoir, their idea about creating uh, the spontaneity of the work and creating en plein air and, and bringing your canvas out to the, to the countryside and painting the, the light reflecting off the river and off the, the poplar trees. And, and that was not something that drove Degas' work at all. Um, so his work tends to be more realistic, uh, more draftsman, so there's more of a, of a drawing quality to it, more carefully composed. Uh, his, his brush strokes and his lines are, are more refined and more solid than what we see with, with uh, Monet and Renoir. I often hear uh, uh, impressionism is, is, is difficult because we think of impressionist technique as being the equivalent of Monet's approach. So the way that Monet approached with his with his broken lines and kind of big globs of colors, so that kind of impasto technique, uh, we think of that being what impressionism is. So so I'm I'm a painter and I paint with kind of a thick impasto technique. And people ask me all the time, well, do you paint with an impressionist? Are you an impressionist painter? You paint with an impressionistic style. And I was like, oh, mm. <laughs> that's a, that's a difficult question to 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 answer because impressionism is is complicated. It's not simply Monet that fits under this umbrella. So his technique doesn't define the group. And in fact, Degas, like I said, his technique doesn't fit. Um, 
he 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 hung out with the group. Uh, they would all congregate at a cafe called the Cafe Gerbois, and and he was there. He participated in some of the exhibitions that they staged, the um, uh, exhibitions of the Impressionists. Um, but he himself felt removed from the group slightly. Uh, he was often kind of at odds. There are reports of him arguing with Monet and Renoir and, and, other, and other ones in the group. Um, but coming back to what, what Impressionism is, or kind of what, despite their differences, both personal and aesthetic, <laughs> what, what unites all of these Impressionists together is first uh, a, a moving away from um, historical and religious painting kind of as a, as, a, as a rule or as at the top of the, the hierarchy or what was driving their, their practice or their vision. So, so French academic art, uh, the kind of the height of, of academic art was to depict a scene from history. So you could paint Napoleon, great. You could paint Caesar, Great, uh, or or again like a scene from religion, so Samson or uh, Jesus, so kind of historical and religious men from whom we can learn uh, a moral lesson. Uh, so there had to be an element, like a didactic element, also to the to the painting. So the impressionists rejected that as an idea, and they turned instead to a depiction of the modern world, the world around them. Uh, so, so they wanted to show scenes of scenes from the real world, so contemporary Paris, contemporary France, so the France of the 1860s, 1870s, 1880s. And we see that with all of them, with Caibot, with Degas, with Monet, Renoir, Basile. None of them are, are interested in painting little cherubs. So it was actually Courbet. Uh, Courbet isn't quite an Impressionist, but he was around the same time. Courbet said, uh, if I saw an angel, I would paint one. So <laughs> he wasn't interested in painting angels or little little flying babies through the air. They wanted to paint the modern world. So that's tenet number one. Number two is using a modern approach to depict the modern world. And we have to be careful not to, again, not to assume that the modern approach was simply Monet's approach, that there is a modern approach that is unique to Caibat or unique to, in this case, Degas, uh, that's more realistic. It doesn't have that same kind of broken brushwork. So those two things, modern life, modern techniques, or modern approach. There's my preamble. Now let's look uh, more closely at this particular painting by Deka. Uh, this is the absinthe drinker, like I said. So we have a scene here. Uh, we're, in a, we're in a cafe, kind of a nighttime, uh, probably a nighttime scene, though we can't really tell. I shouldn't say that, but it, you know, it looks like there's maybe some artificial light we have no scene of the, uh, we can't see the windows or kind of the exterior, so it's very much an interior. And this is typical of, of Degas. Degas was, again, kind of uh, separate from, from some of the other Impressionists because he, he was very much a painter of, of urban life or kind of leisure. Uh, and so we see him showing us scenes of, you know, from, from a night at the opera, a night at the orchestra, uh, from the ballet, uh, here in, in kind of bars or cafes. And there's a woman uh, seated. She, she may be alone. There is, a, there is another figure to her, her left, to the right of the composition. And then, of course, the, from the title of the painting, there is the glass of absinthe. There are three tables. I'll talk more about the tables. But what I want to draw your attention to is, well, those, those two things. So what Marx says as an Impressionist work. One is the, the subject matter. So this, it looks historical to us now, but this would have been a scene of, of, of Degas' temp contemporary. So this would have been a, a typical scene that if we walked into a cafe in 1876, we would see something like this. So this is not a historical figure. This is not Socrates or Caesar. So not a kind of historical man from whom we can learn, a, learn an important moral lesson, just a regular person. And then also the modern approach or the modern technique that Degas is, is employing here. And you can see that the, it, it doesn't look like a painting by Monet, so we don't have kind of broad brush strokes or, or um, kind of solid strokes of color here. There are more, it's more of a, there's more linearity, more kind of careful attention to detail. 
But what marks Dega as, as what I would say is part of the Impressionist is his unique composition. And he always gives us strange angular viewpoints. So here, notice how there is essentially the, the, the left-hand side of the, of the painting and the whole bottom half is essentially or is ostensibly empty. We just have tables and most of the, the, the action, as it were, of the painting is taking place. It's almost crammed up into, the, into kind of the upper or, or far right section of the painting. So we have like, a, like an oblique angle. Well, she does, the, the main figure fits in the center of the composition, but she's, she's kind of shoved away in behind these, these tables. And then the viewer or the painter is stuck behind another table. So we're seeing her at a, at a, at a diagonal line. And that's what's typical, or what's interesting, but then also typical about, about Degas' work. And I'll show you a couple examples. He gives us, like I said, strange and oblique viewpoints from which to, to view the world. So here with this, the musicians in the orchestra from a, a few years earlier. Instead of focusing the scene on what would be the, the center of attention, so it would be the, the ballerinas on the stage, Degas positions us, the viewer, behind the heads of the, of the orchestra musicians, the pit musicians. So we're, we're having this vantage point of looking up to the scene. And notice the figure on the right, his head is completely cut off, not completely cut off, half cut off. So again, kind of a strange and disconcerting viewpoint. And this one especially, oh, this is so neat. So this is the, the green dancer from, from just after the absence drinker. But notice this, this strange kind of high viewpoint. So we're floating above the dancer in this case and looking down on her. So her, her body almost looks kind of squished together and the, the floor rises up at a, at a strange and sharp angle and she's twirling in space with these diagonal lines. And then there are, are two other dancers. We can see two other green tutus to the left and the bottom left, and their bodies are completely severed. So the composition cuts them off completely. So there's always this feeling with Degas that there's more happening in the wings or just outside of the frame. And uh, that was probably due to the influence in part to the invention of the camera. So you can think of, of Degas who, who did experiment with photography or photographers going around with, with um, kind of viewfinders or, you know, looking through the world through this kind of black box now all of a sudden and, and realizing the strength of, uh, of, of composition and being able to, to, to frame scenes in an interesting kind of way. So that's Degas uh, modern, modern methodology. So back now to the absinthe drinker. And, and as I mentioned, we have, this, we have this scene in which there are three tables visible. So she is seated, her and the, the man are seated at the far table to, to the right. There is another table next to the, to the bench. But then there is a third table, which is in the immediate foreground. And it's obvious that we're at that table. So we're viewing her from our own vantage point at another table in the bar, looking across to this, to this woman. And notice how she is, here we go. Notice how her, there's a space between her and the man. We can't read from this image if they're together, if they just happen to be seated at the same table. They're not engaging each other in conversation. There's a, a silence to this. They each have a, have a drink. Her, of course, is the, the absinthe, the glass of absinthe there, the only green that we have in the image. And it stands out because it's, Degas placed it against the dark sleeve of the, of the male figure. Notice the, the slump of her shoulders. So we've caught her in this moment of, of extreme isolation. And uh, I don't know if I go so far as to call it despondency, but just, just uh, inwardness, right? That her, her eyes are unfocused. She's looking past the drink. She's not focused on another character or another figure. 
and that slope of her shoulders too so we can read her as a like I said perhaps a, a despondent kind of figure and as I mentioned this would have been a typical kind of scene so like this this was probably lifted from a, a cafe like this or a bar like this uh, in Paris so just again to show you that this would have been a scene from contemporary life coming back to to the figure Notice how that figure on the on the right, which always there's always someone in 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 Degas paintings, like looking off. It's like they're looking off camera, as it were, right? Or they're looking they're looking beyond the scene, and and there's this always a sense that there's something happening just beyond what we can see. So he's breaking down that 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 barrier, the edge of the painting, and the way that his the pipe is cut off, also. Notice her feet. I think her feet are so interesting. I'm going to go back. I'm going to show you the full image. Okay, so notice the slope in her shoulders, but then also notice her feet. And the way her feet, I think, are they're so interesting because they're, they're not posed in any way. So again, if a, if a figure was, was going to pose for a scene, or if this was an idealized scene of a female figure, her legs would be tucked under her skirts or her, her ankles would be crossed, be much more of a... Of a, a kind of a self-aware posture to her, but her legs, you can see that heel of her boot are kind of propped to the side here, so her feet are resting. It looks like she's uh, been, uh, been, perhaps her feet are tired. And this was read at the time. This painting caused a great deal of consternation uh, because, again, great artwork was supposed to, to convey a moral message or there was supposed to be a didactic quality we were to learn from this and ostensibly there's really nothing to learn here except maybe you know it could, it, potentially it could have been read as a you know a moral message do not fall uh to the to the social ills of of drinking absinthe you know this woman should be home with her children yeah and and so so it it, it was it was met with a great deal of criticism at the time and, and I think too, sometimes now we even tend to read into it as I, as I set up this, this, this discussion, this painting here talking about the idea of solitude. And I think we need to be careful not to imbue it with a sense of morality because I, I don't think, my reading of it anyway, is that I don't think Degas is, is necessarily critiquing her, critiquing her choice here of, of drink or her choice of how she's spending her night because of the way that he's placed us at the other table. So we're complicit. We're also partaking probably in a drink ourselves. And so it's just a commentary perhaps on the, of these moments of solitude or moments of isolation in an urban, urban setting. Yeah, so I try not to, to read too much of a moral message into it, but just that there are times when, when we perhaps are all caught in, a, in an urban setting alone with our thoughts and maybe have moments of, of despondency. So there we have it. Degas, the absence drinker. If you would like to support the lecture series, please do, please do so at jonesgallery.ca slash arthistory. Technical support today by Caleb Jones and I'm Sarah Jones. Thank you for watching.